After we liberate Karakosh, we, we hold the ground. The town now sits under the control of a Christian-based militia. But Mafuk Sata says they need more help. People, they need to come back, but they need to feel safe. They need force on the ground. They need, uh, like, you know, international protection. And that that's will be good, like, like a guarantee. That will never happen again. Jesus was an Aramaic-speaking Jew of the Middle East, and the Assyrians are Aramaic-speaking Christians in the Middle East who have endured persecution for over 1,000 years. Join Voice of the Word Aramaic Bible teacher, artist, and author Stephen Missick as he examines the Bible through the ancient languages, peoples, lands, cultures, and times in which it was first revealed. Research the scriptures, rescue persecuted Christians, and restore the church to its Semitic roots. And now, Voice of the Word. So, I'm Dr. Missick. Welcome to Voice of the Word. And today I have my friend Mo Fook here. And uh, what I want to talk about in this, this segment is, uh, you know, the situation here. Let me talk a little bit about what you went through. Um, Brother Mo Fook did an interview with uh, 700 Clubs Christian Broadcasting Network yeah. when he was serving uh, in the protection units. So for those in the audience who don't know who the Assyrian people are, it's just a, a, a quick uh, overview. So in the Old Testament, you have the, the big empire of the Assyrians, and uh, Jonah the prophet went and he preached to the Assyrians. And every year to this, to this day, Assyrians remember, they have the, the festival called the Rogation of the Ninevites, and they remember that mm -hmm. their ancestors uh, repented of the preaching of, of Jonah. Now, True. the apostle, St. Thomas, on his way to India, he evangelized this area. And before he went, he sent Thaddeus, they call him Mar-Addai in Aramaic, and he established the church here. So this is one of the oldest Christian communities. And it's also very important because our brother Mofuk here mm -hmm. uh, is an Assyrian Christian, and he speaks Aramaic, the language of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this is the oldest Christian community established by directly by the 12 apostles of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. uh, to a community that speaks the same language as Jesus as well. And I was talking to Mofuk about this earlier, but they were a missionary church. They had churches all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, across Arabia, into India, and I've been to India visiting Assyrian Christians there, and all the way to China. So tell us about your experiences uh, based on what happened with the, the Christian Broadcasting Network, and maybe any thoughts? <laughs> we were talking about that. It's like I didn't finish my speech. They cut my speech off. So this is your chance to, you know, because I'm going to air the entire interview, and people can hear what you have to say about your experiences and what happened. Well, um, in 2016, on October 18th, um, Karakosh got liberated from ISIS, and we were on the ground. Uh, I was I, I was serving as a soldier and officer there. Um, I was helping uh, our Christians also to be trained well uh, before we go to, to, the, to the front lines. And uh, I trained in about 600 uh, Christian forces to be strong men, right. strong Christian men yes. to be holding the ground. We've been traveling across uh, Erbil, the Nineveh Plains, and my brother here is like, Oh, I trained him. I met him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All the people that he served with. Defeating ISIS is yeah. interesting to come across when we're on our travels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after that, um, we went to Karakosh and we see the situation of Karakosh. It was big destruction over there. Um, we couldn't be believe that <clears throat> this area will be fixed again. Is there any people they come back to the city? It was big questions in my in my mind and others' mind. It's like. Is it possible to be fixed? Uh, it was big mass, big destruction, uh, houses blown out, churches blown out. It's everything. It's not not ready, even uh, with years to be ready to to be rehabilitated. Like. I want to I want to mention something, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to talk about the, the the interview. But this is something that that Muslims do. This is really sick. Yeah. This is extremist Muslims. I'm not saying all Muslims are bad people because they're not. I'm talking about fundamentalist extremist Muslims, but. There's been, since Islam began, there's been, we're talking about these phases, every 50 to 75 years you have yes. the jihadism, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. We saw it 100 years, 100 years almost, you know, to the year, 
in uh, in two thousand in 1915, you had the Armenian and genocide and Greek, yes. uh, the Armenian, Assyrian, and, and Greek genocide of the Turks, and now you know hundred years later in, in 2015, we had, we saw another genocide, but this has also been going on in, in Lebanon, and I just got back from Lebanon, and I was reading how during the Lebanese civil war, and they also did this here in Iraq. This is really really sick stuff, but like you said. The homes they demolish, the churches they demolish, all the crosses they knock down. Yeah. But then these people are so disrespectful, they went in the cemeteries to desecrate the corpses of Christians who died and to see if they yes. had anything on their bodies. Yes, yes. They did that in Lebanon. And in Lebanon, they're so disgrace, disgraceful that they left. They would leave bodies out. And I was reading this book about the Lebanese Civil War, and it says the Muslims went to the cemetery, and you could see somebody who died in the 1800s wearing her Sunday's best. And it's like, no, just no respect. These extremists, one thing that bothers me about them mm -hmm. is, oh, we believe in the prophet Jesus. We call him Isa. And yet they destroy uh, Bibles and churches. And it's like, where's your respect for the prophet Isa? Uh, and they blaspheme, like in Speaker's Corner in, in England. But basic human decency to show respect to the dead. And uh, I believe that there's, there's God's curse on people that did that. And apparently they did that here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, even uh, you cannot say on that on that interview. Uh, you can see also the graves have been rubbished. Mm -hmm. Like even the the blankets were um, like the dead people rolled out. They they just take it, stool on it. It's nothing. It's horrible. It's worth nothing. But even even the graves have been. The thing is, who thinks like that? <laughs> I mean, these it's evil. These I believe it's ISIS evil. was. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and satanic forces yeah. in high places. And I was talking to Mufak about this before. The ISIS, they targeted, number one, Assyrian Christians. Yeah. Number two, yeah. the Yazidis. Yeah. The Yazidis, they have a very strange religion. They're nice people, but they're not Muslims. And their religion is confusing. Mm -hmm. So they're killing Yazidis. Uh, but then, moderate Muslims. And the things they would do, beheadings, crucifixions, yeah. uh, mass shootings. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I couldn't even believe that they would do this. They filled a swimming pool up mm -hmm. with acid and they would throw people. Yeah. Or they put people in cages and slowly dip them into acid so that they would uh, right. be incinerated. And, and it's like, yeah. I think Dochatevsky uh, talked about the uh, the Turks in Bulgaria were doing, you know, ISIS type things back mm -hmm. whenever Dochatevsky's writing in the 1800s, I guess. And uh, Dochatevsky says, animals aren't as bad. He yeah. says, wild animals don't do these terrible things that these Islamic extremists right. do, you right. know? But they're worse right. than animals right. because it's uh, a demonic. We all need to have Jesus Christ in our heart, right? Mm -hmm. People talk about in America how that we have a void in our heart that only Jesus can feel, fill. And I think that, that if sometimes if, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, then sometimes, you know, an, a demon or a false god will come into your heart. Right. And it talks about how Jesus talked to himself about someone who had a demon that left, and his heart wasn't right. And so seven more demons came in that person's heart, made him even more worse than he was before. Right. So this is a spiritual. And this is, we need to do more than just pray. We need to share the gospel. We need to give. We need to put our lives on the line for, right. for the Lord. <clears throat> but be informed and pray. Prayer has very, has very great power. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I just, I just want to yeah. hit that point. So what else did you want to say? Yeah, so... Um, uh, we said who gonna like start of rehabilitation of homes because families when they return back they need homes. This is first thing that they they, they need shelter. So um, there was like several organizations that come to to the area. I met some of them. Samaritans Help, like, which is the the Graham evangelistic organization. Yeah, yeah. Billy Graham and Franklin Graham did yeah, a lot. Yeah, you yeah. needed to, to acknowledge what yeah, Samaritans per, yeah. purse was doing. But now there's a lot of need that's not there's a lot of need that's not being yeah. met, met, and it's like all these organizations that were helping the Syrians rebuild have retreated, right? And there's still a great need here, but it's it's not being met. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can somehow facilitate yeah. that. So, so um, um, like I was praying, and that God, uh, like, was speaking to my heart, like, say, I will use you also on the on the ground here to fix the houses. I was working as a soldier, um, and as, as a soldier, like um, just volunteer, non-paid non also, uh, because it's my land. That's it's, <laughs> sometimes that's what you need to do. I left my family behind right. in Erbil, uh, my, left my children, and then I joined these forces. We were not paid any salary until like uh, after seven or eight months, like government mm. says, like they, 
they put this uh, group of militia, of Christian militia, under Hajj al-Shaabi name. And it was 100% Christians, soldiers. And 100% Christians leaders. And that was good because there's no evil, no evil in between us. We are all Christians. We know what we need. We need our lands back. So we got our lands back. And Iraqi army for sure helped us and was on our side and uh, international coalition was on our side. And we pushed ISIS back to Mosul and we got Nineveh plane liberated from ISIS. And we say like, we need to, to start building a ho our homes. So there was organization that helped us and it was um, CAPNI organization, SRS, um, uh, Samaritan's Purse, um, few organization, I apologize if I didn't remember them, but uh, they did great job there. They helped families to be returned back. They fixed homes. Uh, homes was burned, was flat, was yeah. stolen. I saw the it. Churches. Your home was a pile of concrete yeah. rubble, sadly. It was rubble, yeah. So this is war. We can't say um, God will provide us and he's providing us and he's on our side. And even I, I trust God. Even no hair from my head will fall without his knowledge. That's so, what Jesus said. Yeah, so to, we are we trusting God yes. that the better is coming. But for mm -hmm. now, um, after the election uh, happened in, in the United States, uh, that Biden goes right. to be president of the United States, so, all the fund that of this organization, right. it goes. And uh, right. we return to, to maybe less than... Yeah. Zero point. So, so Trump was supporting the Iraqi Christians, right. and once Biden came in, it's mm -hmm. finished. I remember this is terrible, but I mean, I mean, it happened. Biden took over as president, yeah. and he had his desk, and they had a big pile of paper, and he goes, "I don't even know what I'm signing. I'm signing executive orders. Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> you know, I don't even know what I'm signing. Oh, they gave me this big, you know, five hundred yeah. sheets of paper, one after another, and probably one of those things was, uh, you know, defunding the Christians yeah. and a lot of terrible, wicked things." Uh, they're doing, but really quick, I want to mention two things that are very important in any struggle we find ourselves in. Number one is sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah. like with the American Revolution, uh, our patriots are fighting under George Washington. They didn't have enough. They didn't have enough weapons. They didn't have clothes. A lot of them didn't have shoes, uh, and yet they loved their country. And mm -hmm. they, you know, that was the number one thing is they sacrificed. Yeah. I mean, it was cold in winter, and. Uh, and you have to sacrifice. Sometimes it's not about money, it's about the greater yeah, good, it's yeah, about doing what's yeah. right. So number one is sacrifice. Number two is perseverance. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, Benedict Arnold was winning victories, but he wanted, he wanted uh, uh, you know, esteem and <laughs> people to recognize him. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not getting the recognition I deserve. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to betray my country and go to England. Uh, so Link, uh, Washington himself, he won a victory here and there, but sometimes he wasn't winning big victories, just a little skirmish, and sometimes he's defeated and, and, yeah. and, and retreating. But but Washington did, did not give up. He persevered until American victory mm -hmm. was won and we had independence. So that's that's lessons for all of us, fighting a spiritual war for sometimes real wars. I'm gonna stand here, they're not, maybe they're not paying me, but this is the right thing to do, and I'm gonna fight as long as I can. Mm -hmm. And we're not gonna give up. And that's the challenge that many, many Christians here are facing right now, is people so, went back to their villages, they rebuilt, but now things are getting difficult, and they're thinking about uh, becoming refugees, right. <laughs> you know, it's like they were refugees. They came back, they got their house back, but then they're now they're discouraged, and it's like, what is there for me here with all these difficulties? Maybe I should, you know, uh, become a refugee again. It's but also you, my brother, I appreciate it. Yesterday we met these people that were perplexed in their mind and confused. And you said, mm -hmm. no, have faith, believe. Let's maintain yeah. this Christian presence here. Don't give up. Uh, have faith. Yeah. Endure sufferings for Jesus. There's going to be a better day. Yeah. So. Which is good. Yeah, it's good. Um, I, I'm against of uh, like for people, Christians, to leave the country. I, I don't like this idea. Because we are right. the, the, the people who, who receive this first message mm -hmm. of receiving Jesus. We are the people who are um, sacrificed right. and we give, we redeem this is, this to, is be, kind of, to be here. In a way, immigration can be genocide in a it sense. Is. Because what happens, you know, America's like, oh, we're a nation of immigrants. And it's just gotten to a point like 
you know, we're overwhelmed. You know, it's good to be generous and want to help people and provide sanctuary. But for the Christians here, here's what happens. Is when they immigrate, the community becomes smaller. Smaller, yeah. And then what happens is the people that leave, by the third or fourth generation, they're not Assyrians anymore. Yeah. They're totally assimilated in American culture. They don't know the Aramaic language. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now, there's a, they are passing down their culture in, 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 in the Assyrian enclaves in, uh, in, in Chicago, Turlock, uh, California, in Arizona. But it's only a matter of time. Mm -hmm when you will just be totally enveloped and lose your cultural identity. So, um, I, don't, I just think there's good things about immigration, but there's also a drawback as well. And I think that escaping here, it's, it's like I said, it's a type of genocide through immigration in a, in a sense. Yeah, um, one of the uh, main uh, reasons of, uh, that Christians is emigrating now, it's uh, the area being controlled for, from another forces which is aligned to Iran. And as if you go to 1980, uh, Christians and Karakush was the biggest area with mortars. We, 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 we give a, a good and beautiful man against, fighting against Iran. It wasn't our war, but right, we, were, right, right. we were in the you're, system. You're talking Saddam. about the, the Iran-Iraq war. Yeah. So yeah. Christians were fighting. So they were fighting yeah. against Iran, and they against, defending Iraq. So we right. give... Uh, and uh, it was Karakosh was village in that time. We give like in about hand, 400 soldier mm -hmm. Christians, and that was a. Uh, I mean, it's big different with this right. number. It I understand. I understand that that was an eight year war, and yeah. I, I think in a way it was necessary. But uh, many many Iranians and many Iraqis died. You mm -hmm. know, we don't want that. We need to remember those who fought for their country, fought for freedom. Yeah. And so what you're saying is a lot of uh, soldiers fighting radical Islam against the, the incursions and, and threat of Iran and gave their lives. Yeah, so, uh, so each each house in that time lost one of their sons. I'm named on my uncle's name. He passed away by the war. Mm. So you're so, named after your uncle who died in yeah, the war. Yeah, And that time, um, the Christians didn't test any, any safe situation, any good life. So I've been suffering from that time. From maybe, 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 maybe before. Also, I didn't know. Forty I years. I don't know. Mm -hmm. They they've been suffering till like 2014 and 2003. They suffered, and we had lots of things happening around us. Like uh, people, they ignore Christians. They they just let them out of their government uh, jobs or do bad things That's or a fake uh, discrimination yeah it's discrimination okay so itself. you have you have a it's like yeah. on all sides right it's like kind of socialist or or economist or any any side of even even like uh, they said iraq had been democrats country it's right. not because no. the christian are not in this government right. value so what happens yazidi are not value in the in right. the government right so what happens is, and you're right about this, Islam is not just a religious system, it's a system of government. Yeah. And what happens, you have the Ummah, or the people. Yeah. The only way you can be part of the Ummah is if you're a Muslim. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a Jewish, if you're a Christian, if you're a Yazidi or some other sect, you're not, you you're not able to participate in the government fully. You're a second-class uh, non-citizen, yeah. or quasi-citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just the way it is. And... and uh, that's one of my one of the issues I have with Islam is like you know hey if you want to pray five times towards Mecca you know whatever mm. but when you actively discriminate against people and deny people the human rights that's that's not good so I want to conclude this segment but I want you to you know what did you want to say in the CBN interview that you didn't get to say well it was um, we had maybe nine or or ten churches in Karakosh all was burned and. It was destroyed. It. I mean, it was destroyed. It was burned, hardly burned. Like we, we put as a burned houses also as a categories. It was third level. Right. So you had different categories. So you had to go do an inventory yeah. of the city. Yeah. And how are things damaged? Yeah. You know, so A, B, C, D. It was it was damaged. It was totally damaged. Mm -hmm. We can say. But it was one mosque in Karakosh and been uh, that mosque it been built. Uh, uh, during Saddam time, so Christian can do nothing for, it. right? Even uh, it was on their lands, and they take the lands by power, 
but they do nothing for because it's uh, it's shut down. It's dictatorial. Right? That's that's kind of funny how you have these regimes yeah. that claim to be oh we're secular like in Syria or or Saddam, and yet you have a hundred percent Christian village and put a mosque <laughs> there to so show they, they want to show you who's the boss. They, 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 <laughs> they put mosque and the ISIS camp. Mm-hmm. And they destroyed the whole city. Except for the mosque. Each house been touched by ISIS. Mm-hmm. Each millimeter been touched by ISIS. But the mosque is still okay. This this thing, it surprised me. It surprised me. Why this uh, churches and houses and buildings and all markets been stolen and destroyed? That mosque. It, even we went there. It was like, okay, there's live in like water and green the grass and trees, they were taking care of it. So I, as I look at that thing, it was like, why, why we have been targeted always? And they are living, like, I mean, the Muslims live in, in the rest, in and peace. Okay, right. So they are doing bad things against other people. And when you right. come to speak with them, they, they get the good thing, the right. good ayah from, from the Quran. I think they say there's a saying, I don't know if it's from the Quran. They are like, not balanced. It's like Muslims, we are so loving to one another, but we're fierce against the infidel, against the unbeliever. That's what they so say. So the Christians, like the law of Iraq needs to be changed right. to be equals with every Iraqi, or every citizen. I did a... It's not, it's right. still like Islamic religion. And in our courts right. now, when we go to courts, as Christians, we have our laws also. Right. But we, that, they use uh, right. um, Islamist laws on the Christians. Right. They apply it on the Christians. I, you know, people who claim to be a Muslim, I, I, I came up with this, it's, it's a, I have a video called The Four Principles of Moderate Islam. And one of them should be that uh, Islam is a personal, I mean, a, Sharia should be a personal lifestyle choice. It shouldn't yeah. be anything of force of law. Uh, also, it's like women should not be forced to. That's kind of related to the uh, to that one. Mm-hmm. But number one is Sharia should be a personal choice. If you want to be Sharia, yeah, yeah, well, it's... knock yourself out. But it shouldn't have force of law, <clears throat> right? Uh, number number two thing that they need to to be a moderate. If you're really moderate, because if if you believe that Sharia law should be enforced, then you believe in religious discrimination, right? You believe in chopping off arm, and, arms and hands and things like that. That's Sharia law. So, but Sharia law entails a lot of things, but it should only be a personal lifestyle choice. Secondly, if you're really a moderate, you believe in in uh, individual rights and freedoms, which means that you should have no religious discrimination. Mm-hmm. And I I should remember the four points, but then another one was if you're really a moderate, you would believe that a Muslim has the right to become an atheist, to become a Christian, to place his trust in Jesus Christ yeah. and renounce Islam or convert to whatever religion mm-hmm. he believes in or no religion at yeah, all. Yeah. Because the other option is like, because you believe, if you believe someone should be put to death for receiving Jesus Christ in their, in their heart, mm-hmm. and, and the issue is this has happened where the, the father figure has been gone. I'll, I'll give you an example. There's a woman from Ethiopia and her biological father mm-hmm. was a Muslim. And he disappeared, and his his her mother was a Christian, so she's raised as a Christian. Mm-hmm. So she she met a Christian man in church, and she's going to get married. And they arrested her, mm-hmm. and they were going to kill her. He says, "By law, you're a Muslim because your father's a Muslim, and you can't be a Christian, and we're going to kill you." Mm-hmm. She was actually pregnant, and she was about to have a baby, and they they put uh, they put chains on her. Her and she gave birth Sorry, with shackles yeah. on her ankles. And her her husband, fiance, uh, she was trying to marry him. I, you know, I guess she married in the church. She's trying to go the, the you know have a legal marriage to the the state, and you know they th- put her in a dungeon. And then Obama would not help her for until like the until she gave birth the baby. He let her suffer in prison. He probably just make a phone call. I think it's a Sudan. I'm the president of the United States. This is an American citizen's wife, but he wouldn't do it mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. We know why. Uh, but that's an example. Is they're going to kill this woman, but she didn't know Islam. She, her father, didn't raise her as a Muslim. Yeah. All she knew was Christianity. Uh, so that is not moderation, and that's happened. I think in uh, is Pastor Abadani in in Iran, the same thing. He his father never taught him Islam, and he's like, what is who is God? And he, I'll just pick up the Bible. Oh, Jesus Christ, it's all this God is our Father. I love this. I, 
I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'll become a pastor. And what happened is he was just visiting an orphanage. She wasn't doing anything. I think he had American citizenship. And he was in, Obama left him in prison for like five years, being tortured and beat up by everybody, by, by uh, fanatics. Yeah. So, yeah, we do need, we need, we need moderate Islam. And we need all these people accountable. And said, so, look, this is, we're in the 21st century. We have to have human rights and equality. No religious discrimination. Muslims should have the right to, to convert if they want to. And uh, uh, that Jesus said, go, you can tell the world, make converts. Everybody needs Jesus. Jesus mm -hmm. said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, yeah. all right, any concluding thoughts? Yeah, so my, uh, my idea about uh, how to keep Christians in their lands, uh, there are some points needs to be happening on the ground, which is safe situation mm -hmm. to have. The families, when they live there, needs to feel safe needs to be uh, guarded. And the second thing, um, Europe and um, Australia and Canada and US, they are rece receiving refugees. Right. Instead of the receiving refugees, we know they need uh, worker hands. Right. They need, they need somebody to work for them. Right. But instead of you, you just keep those people. You, you are saying human, humanitarian and you, you, you are saying humanitarian rights and uh, blah 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 all this speech. It do nothing. Right. There's something it needs to be on the ground. Right. Instead of you give the welfare in Australia right. it needs these people to travel to Australia and get receive money and do to be in good situation of economy situation. Send this assistant for them here and give it to them here and you can do factory on right. these lands and benefit from your factory that you built on these lands. We should, we should think about doing that. Like, for instance, it's like there's many a, things. We have a lot of migrants in, in, in Texas, and now we're sending them, because the border's open, we're sending them to Washington State and uh, New York City and Washington, D.C. They don't want them. Why do they not want them? These liberal people, because um, they cost. That's mm -hmm. why. Because they have to help them with shelter and, and, and food and, and also they have to build new schools because they don't have the facilities. These people yeah. are an economic burden on us. And I don't think that's right. You know, it's like their education and health care. They yeah. They're citizens of other countries. Yeah. They're the responsibilities of El Salvador, Guatemala and all that. So what I'm saying is if we help these countries sometimes, or, or for instance, they talk about how, how expensive the wall is. You know, oh, if they build a wall, it costs, but it'll save us money because they, we spend so much money on these people who are, yeah. you know, become a financial burden on the system because yeah. they're, they come over, they want, that's why they're coming over. They want to come to America so they can live off the American taxpayer. Yeah. But the, yeah, the border open brings drugs mm -hmm. and crime, so it's, it's not good. But like you're saying, sometimes it's just, if we're going to give them money, might as well give them money in their own way sometimes. So uh, it's a good idea. Like, yeah. Yeah, if you need to help those people to stay, um, like, there's kind of uh, agreement with the governments, between the governments. Um, there's meeting between the governments. And put, uh, like, the governments can do law or uh, get agreement about those people. Mm -hmm. The minor minority of these people, they need to stay. Uh, I need to be guarding them. Uh, I need to offer for their soldiers as, like, weapons, uh, tactical things mm -hmm. to be defending their lands. This is good. Yeah, and I, I support second the, thing, the most instead of I take these people from their lands and immigrate them to Australia or Europe or right. uh, Canada, America, right. I will collect those assistance as I give it welfare there. I can do with this for welfare right. uh, factors here, um, right. like um, any any kind, any in, type invest, of agricultural. Yeah, invest, invest in the money. local community. Yeah, help yeah. The, the the Assyrian community here needs. We need to support the militias. Yeah. The thing is, it's like, oh, that's, that's militaristic. It's like, well, they're vulnerable to ISIS. You give them arms and supplies and training. Yeah. They can protect themselves from ISIS. The threat is real. Yeah. The secondly is, like you said, maybe welfare to help these people, but also economic incentives uh, for agriculture, but also to, to do business and manufacturing mm -hmm. in this area. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If they they going to do this, people will never think in immigration. Right, right. Right. So in this way, you kept their culture, right. you kept their language, mm -hmm. you kept their uh, socials. Right. You kept it's their, a way to preserve. You kept their lands right. to, to be Christian lands, right. and 
there's yeah. where where's the Christianity is there's right. light. Right. In in Ankawa, which is a largely Christian suburb of Erbil, you know, a lot of the street signs are in in Aramaic. Right. If we have a Christian community here that's safe and is a, a, be able to to survive and thrive, then the Aramaic language has a future as a spoken language. Right. If the people immigrate, then the culture will be lost through assimilation to the Western countries they immigrate to mm -hmm. within decades sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Uh, we might do one more segment, but that's today's, uh, today's episode. Mm -hmm. um, so just stay in touch with uh, uh, our program, Voice of the Word, but also I want to continue to do outreach and ministry to this part uh, to impact the Syrian community in the Middle East, Mesopotamia, their homeland, with the gospel of the Messiah. Research, rescue, and restore. Help Voice of the Word and Aramaic Christian Ministries Mission research the ancient languages, peoples, lands, cultures, and times of the Bible. Rescue persecuted Assyrian Christians in the Middle East and restore Christianity to its original Semitic roots. For Stephen Missick's books, online giving, and other resources from Aramaic Christian Ministries, visit www.stephenmissick.com. Join us next time on Voice of the Word as we research the scriptures, rescue persecuted Christians, and restore the church to its Semitic roots.